So welcome to Proctoring Online Accommodated Exams the Laurier Way. This webinar is hosted by the Network of Assistive Technologists on this Thursday, the 11th of June, 2020. In late March, the Accessibility Learning Department at Laurier was, taking, was tasked, tasked with developing, and very quickly so, a virtual proctoring system for AT accommodated exams. As a result, Sorry, as a result of the new remote environment. So today we are joined by Jean, Jennifer, and Esther, and they will be going over the goals and processes used to set up their virtual proctoring system, considerations for such systems, and what they learned along the way. They'll also share samples of training, tracking documents, and email templates. So at this point, I'd like to hand the presentation over to Jane, Jennifer, and Esther and allow them to share their screens and continue. Thanks, Doug. Um, so it's Jane Friedrich here. I'm going to share my screen, which is basically a very short uh, PowerPoint presentation that we have, and then um, we're welcome to entertain any questions. We realize that time is short that we have together, and we're happy to share with you and, and hear your experiences as well. So. Um, I'm just going to go out to my PowerPoint right now. Okay, let's do that. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see the PowerPoint presentation in slideshow mode. Is that yeah. happening, Doug? Yes, it is. Okay. So, um, Basically, uh, <laughs> you can see the little guy in the stool. <laughs> Many of you have felt like that during this process. Um, we certainly have, uh, and at the beginning, it was, it was just, um, a very uh, disruptive process to try and, and get something going. Um, we've learned a lot along the way. Um, and uh, I'll start with basically our origin story. So. Um, first of all, uh, I want to, before I, I start with the origin story, I want to uh, just give you a few acronyms that I'm going to be using along the way. MLS is my learning space and that's the uh, desire to learn or D2L brand of the um, online learning system that we have at Laurier. I know a lot of you are familiar with D2L. AIM is our database and some of you might be familiar with that as well. Um, and another term that I use, which is, might be specific to us, is AVIT, and that is our AV department, um, specifically, it's a subset of our IT department, and we call them AVIT. So if I use those terms, um, that's what I mean. I'll try to be as clear as possible. So um, the origin story started where, in the middle of March, um, we had a request from our instructors to uh, do something about um, the fact that we didn't have online, we didn't have in-class systems anymore to host online exams that um, used Respondus Lockdown Browser, where we would take off Respondus Lockdown Browser and monitor. Um, and uh, so it could be used with students with assistive technology. So we had a lot of large first year courses where students were um, writing at the same time. Um, and all of a sudden, we had students who were remote. So we had to um, develop a, a system very quickly. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of you were in the same situation. Um, I understand that a lot of institutions do use Respondus Lockdown Browser and Monitor. Uh, so that's where we were. So we got a request. Um, and so Uh, let me go to the next slide here. Oops. Just wanting to go back to here. Next page. There. Okay, so what we had to work with, um, we had lots of lovely proctors available. We were fortunate to have Esther um, Adebi, who is here today with us. She's an invigilation assistant. Um, so she's like a lead proctor, if you will. Um, so she trains proctors and she's been with us from the beginning. Um, so she's very knowledgeable about, you know, what happens within that 
uh, situation. Um, so we had proctors who were available. Um, we had Zoom uh, and we had our learning system, uh, which was the, ended up being the preferred teaching arrangement. So it took a while for the dust to settle on, on what the university was going to support. So we were going back and forth between Zoom and Teams uh, in terms of what the university would support, um, you know, concerns around privacy, concerns around um, usability uh, and uh, the different features within the, within the, the different platforms. Uh, but eventually, they went with uh, the university decided to support Zoom, so we have an enterprise license for that. So that's what we had to work with. Um, we did have a little bit of time to test and set up, not a lot. This happened in the middle of midterms. So um, we had midterms going on, and those were our first exams that we actually um, set up were uh, a series of midterms, and then we went into finals after that. We had good and open communication with our a ITS department and AVIT, which is our AV department, and they were the ones who arranged the license um, and were able to communicate um, to Zoom on our behalf um, if we had any questions at a, a higher level. Um, and also, we have an online learning department who is responsible for the um, MLS, the, the D2L product, our, our online learning system. And so we had lots of meetings with them and very good open communication with those people. Faculty were given a few weeks to decide how they wanted to set up their course. So we were trying to set this up at the same time that faculty was trying to figure out what they were going to do for their finals, which was really interesting. Um, so we didn't have a sense of how, how many instructors were going to change their final to an assignment, what they were going to do. Um, so we had to have find a system to to figure that out very quickly. Um, we didn't have a lot to go on as far as as numbers as a result. Um, we could estimate we knew who had AT and we knew what had been used in the courses so far from our AIM database. Um, so and the AVIT staff were very helpful in, in testing with us. Um, and we also had some great help with the, from the proctors and students. Um, to test. So that's sort of the environment that we had to work with. So what did we need to do? We needed to figure out which students needed virtual proctoring, who needed to be in the loop, who needed to be informed about what was going on, um, how, do, how do we schedule things, um, can we use our database to schedule, can we um, do we need another type of a means of, of scheduling? Um, how do we prepare the students? Because this was very, very new for them. Uh, very few students had used Zoom before and um, our proctors as well. How do we train them? So as we were still working out the rules of who does what, we're, we were you know, getting together and testing things out and deciding um, on the fly who was going to take on certain roles and, and how they were going to do things. Um, so the exams area actually um, reached out to uh, other institutions to see what they were doing um, to provide students with access to AT. Um, so they did have a little bit of information that way and the director and associate um, VP of teaching and learning met about the issue and they decided to move forward with Zoom. Um, so a live virtual proctor would be present and the student would have lockdown browser disabled. So the basic process, so we developed this process and communicated it to students, faculty, so everybody understood how exams would work. Um, and so the exam area um, recruited proctors um, from the current pool, including the vigilation assistants, um, Esther, who um, was one of the people who took the lead on training new proctors as the process was developed. Um, faculty and online learning were working together to ensure that lockdown browser was, just, was disabled. <clears throat> um, and then I and the other AT and, and exams people, we developed and provided an orientation system for students um, before their first test with a virtual proctor. And this was really important because um, it would have been, I think, a nightmare had we not had the ability to test things with students the first time they, they used it. Uh, so we worked out a lot of um, issues that way and I'll go over that process a little later on. 
So the IT department, um, again, offered, uh, in collaboration with Lonely Learning, they offered email support in the event there were problems with the detailed platform in accessing the exam and the student, um, you know, looking at the extra time, adding in the extra time, um, and they also supported if there was a technical issue. So the students basically let us know um, through booking their exams with us uh, that they uh, um, needed uh, the uh, a needed AT and um, that they and we figured out you know what type of format the exam was in and most of the profs by finals were actually using um, Zoom uh, it, or using Zoom and using or sorry using uh, D2L for their finals. Some of them decided they were going to go with assignments. Some of them um, decided that they were going to have a different form of, a, of the exam, a take-home exam or something like that. So um, as things got known, we, you know, crossed, got to cross students off our list and that sort of thing. Um, the exam schedule um, basically now is, is based on our database. So we can put everything in the database and schedule exams that way. And, and Jen um, can talk a little bit more about that. Um, so we have a virtual proctoring of EP document um, right now. And I'll share that document with you where we track orientations um, and uh, basically what we need to do. It's a basic scheduling document um, information after we have the information put in the database. Um, we can just track things quickly um, and it's available. So time needs to be added. Uh, lockdown browser needs to be taken off at that point. Um, and then the proctor once will send a meeting invite once that um, uh, orientation is completed with the student. And um, the invite is, is sent out about 24 hours prior to the exam. Um, and the proctors then uh, go in and, and proctor the exam one-to-one -one with students. Uh, so that's the basic process. So we um, know through students, exam schedules, um, we offer an orientation, we get people to add time, remove lockdown browser, so we can set up the exam properly, send the meeting invite, and, and we proctor the exam seems simple but <laughs> a lot more to it than that so we'll go into that a little bit more so here's a scheduling doc that we have um, hopefully everybody can see that but basically um, it a outlines uh, when the exam is going to occur um, the time of the exam standard the standard column the third column there gives you the time the actual exam time. So this is without the student's extra time. We'll add that to that later. Um, so then we've got the course, the prof, the prof contact, um, whether they're, how they're available, um, uh, whether they, they're taking questions or not, uh, student name, student email, um, which is heavily redacted there, uh, any aids that they, they need. So whether there's um, spell check, uh, any aids, memory aids, that sort of thing. Um, accommodations, so what actually uh, 20x is extra time, so 20 minutes extra per hour, Kurzweil, um, Dragon, uh, Dictation, Dragon Dictation, um, use of a calculator, breaks, so SPEL is spell check, so we have our own sort of codes for those things. Then the proctor, um, so whether and when my LS uh, my learning space, online learning, has been contacted to uh, confirm that they've uh, disabled lockdown browser. Then we note that in that column. And then the orientation. So the orientation, when I or someone else completes an orientation, we indicate here that they've been contacted, first of all. Um, and when it was, when the orientation was completed. Um, not required um, is, is, uh, put in there because sometimes, since this is our second round, students have already been through an orientation, so we don't require them to go through an orientation um, each time, just the first time that they use Zoom, the first time that they, they're uh, working with us in a virtual proctoring environment, then we do an orientation. Um, and then any other notes. Um, so uh, notes can include things like 
uh, poor interconnect connection, uh, just so proctors are aware of anything that would uh, affect the exam outcome um, or unusual setups. So if a student has multiple screens, um, then they might, we might note that there, um, any unusual types of audio setups, that sort of thing. Okay. So what we have learned. So I'm going to pass this over to um, Jen now, and um, uh, she can talk about sort of what the things that we have learned. Um, I do have a, a document that I will share with you that has um, virtual, it's the virtual proctoring orientation. Um, so it's got some information about uh, you know, what you need to go over in a virtual um, proctoring orientation session um, and it sort of gives you an idea of what the, the proctor does in the orientation session, how they set things up as well. It's got some sample email templates to request an orientation meeting for a student and that sort of thing. So I'm going to stop right now um, and pass it over to Jen. Great, thank you, Jane. So my name is Jennifer Hunt and I'm one of the exam coordinators. And Esther is actually here with us as well, who will be able to help answer some questions at the end um, around some of the proctor issues that came up. So Esther is one of our invigilation assistants. Um, and then she kindly uh, was able to proctor for us during that uh, very difficult time that we had to uh, fa all face there. So um, just a few things that I wanted to go over. Um, so Jane was able to share that spreadsheet with you. And so that was something that we were able to you know, eventually get students booking into the system. And then we we're taking the information we received in the system in terms of what students had booked AT in particular, we would move that over to our spreadsheet. Um, everything else was just extra time. So that was dealt with differently. Um, during finals, we just had online learning who would actually set the extra time. Now that we're into tests and midterms and quizzes again for the spring term, we have faculty that are doing that. So just so you're aware. Um, so basically uh, what would happen is the, uh, you know, once Jane had the orientation completed um, and then uh, our proctors would go in and they can actually look at the spreadsheet and get that information. Or if they don't have access to our spreadsheet, we could provide the information about each, each exam. And about 24 hours before the test, the proctor would send the Zoom meeting link to the student. So when the student meets the proctor on Zoom, approximately 15 minutes before the test starts, students need to show ID, so that's the key piece. Uh, proctor makes announcements about not having cell phones, Fitbits, Apple Watches, or any electronic devices on their person. And if the meeting stops unexpectedly for any reason, um, proctors are to try to resend the Zoom invite and the student can rejoin. And I know Esther had a kind of a few little hiccups um, that happened, but I can tell you that we had 42 exams that we've run this way successfully. No student has not written um, at Waterloo campus and Brantford, I believe had 16. So we've you know fared pretty well with this process. Um, students, once they are met, they've met on Zoom with the proctor, then they're asked to share, share the screen with the proctor at all times. And at the beginning of the test, we have students move the webcam around the room. So it's very similar to, you know, the process for lockdown browser anytime. A student would have to show that they have nothing, no, you know, no notes uh, anywhere that they, you know, there could be a potential for academic misconduct. So they just have to show that and that there's no one in the room giving them information. Um, then the proctor advises the student that if their computer crashes or the internet access fails at any time, that the best option is to um, immediately just, uh, you know, shut down the computer, try to reboot, um, and see if that helps. Um, again, we could probably uh, have Esther comments if any of that happened, but I don't think there were many situations where we had a lot of issues there. Um, if students lose internet access and cannot resume, they're told to contact the instructor. So this would be if the window um, for when the student can join the test is now closed and the student 
has not been able to get on for some reason, then they would just contact their instructor and then arrangements would have to be made for an alternate time to write. Now, again, we didn't have that happen, which we were really happy about that because we weren't sure how that was gonna go. Um, if Kurzweil is not working for some reason, so it's interesting because Esther did have a situation recently and so the student tried to change some things in settings. Um, one of the things that um, Angel who works at our Brantford campus has talked about too is, you know, just restarting Kurzweil and sometimes that will, will um, initiate things again. So that's something that occurred as well. Um, and then we have our proctors complete a monitoring report. So this is typical uh, standard process that we follow for any exam. So we just continued with that. So that would give us any information that happened during the test um, that if we had to report that back to faculty or, you know, if there was somebody having questions, even the consultants, if they had some questions around uh, what happened during the exam, then we could report that back. And what we do is we just have the proctors actually email. We just kind of created a little doc and then just had the, uh, the uh, proctors just email that to us after they completed uh, their sessions with students. Um, for permitted aid, so that's something that obviously for a lot of tests, especially finals, um, profs allow students to use certain aids. Um, so the proctors would have that information and then the student um, would just need to show that the permitted aids like to the camera. So for instance, if it was a calculator, they need to show that it was the proper calculator that they're, they're allowed to use. If it was scrap paper, just showing that there's nothing on that scrap paper before they start the exam. So these are all things that the prof would allow all students to use during an exam. Um, even things like, um, you know, I know, well, actually my daughter wrote an exam and she was saying that the prof had them um, at some point email their uh, kind of like, I guess a, a cheat sheet that they use at the end of the exam. So this is all based on what the faculty has already arranged for all students in the class. And we just follow obviously the same process. Spell check. Um, so students can use uh, spell check within the uh, MyLS program that we use at Laurier. Um, so as long as it's an approved accommodation, students are able to use it. Um, breaks, so this was always an interesting one. Um, so obviously the same as breaks with a student writing in a classroom or writing in a room with our proctors um, in person, the student, if they had a, a, an accommodation for a break, then they would just need to be doing, having that break in view of the proctor and obviously not have anything on their person. But the other, so, so within the Zoom environment, then this, the proctor would just need to be able to see the students. So they'd have to be in view of the camera. Obviously if washroom break students were let, would just let the proctor know they're taking washroom break and the proctor just would record the length of any break on our monitoring um, form that we have. So, and then questions were tricky too, right? Because we have a process at Laurier that, when we ask for information about exams, um, we actually ask faculty for their cell phone information so that if students writing with our center have a question during the exam, we can contact them and text them for and ask them the question. Um, in this case, profs would come with kind of different ways of approaching this. So some have said that students could email them. So I, it's gonna be interesting to see how this is gonna kind of play out for spring term because um, in lockdown browser, obviously the cameras on them, you know, I'm, ta I'm talking about students that are not necessarily virtually proctored, but so it's really difficult to just grab your phone and ask that question and not be accused of potentially the academic misconduct. So we've had a few faculty mention that students can email. So um, yeah, so we'll see how that goes. But um, obviously with the virtual proctoring, you have the proctor watching the student i mean again we don't know what they're asking on that phone or you know whatever but we are just taking direction on whatever the prof is the faculty is saying for the whole class that's what we're following and again we just have students um i just wanted to mention that they book their tests and they request kurzweil um and they never follow up with orientation sometimes so jane will do the reach out to them um and then here's nothing back so we are just kind of, again, just thinking, continuing to think around that because we could have a situation where we um, initiate the faculty member or online learning to disable lockdown browser, but then the student might not write with us and might write at home and then have access, right? So 
that is a little bit of a concern for us still. So we're just, we just make sure we do not um, request lockdown browser to be disabled till the very last moment so that we know that the students connected with Jane has done the orientation and is aware. So anyway, um, so yeah, that's pretty much everything that I had to offer there. Jane, if you want to continue on. Thanks, Jen. Um, so basically, uh, you know, we're at this stage where we can just talk about questions. We're sort of halfway through. Um, I that's a, a quick overview of, of what we've done. I think <clears throat> generally we were uh, surprised, and we still are surprised <laughs> that we're doing this. Uh, I think that it's worked out pretty well. Um, I think it's worked out better than than I had hoped. I don't know about you, Jen, but I think it's, it seems to be um, going okay. Um, I wonder if, if we could ask Esther to give her point of view about uh, proctoring um, at this point. Esther, do you have anything to add to um, what we've, we've already done here? Um, yes, um, thank you, Jane. So I just wanted to add that um, one of the things, it was quite a learning curve actually, but one of the things that actually helped us at the beginning was to come up with uniform settings for all the proctors. So we had we had different sessions with Jane and uh, even the exam coordinators as well, uh, Jen, where we came up, okay, we wanted the settings to be uniform for all proctors so that the students can, you know, uh, be exposed to the most basic things, nothing complicated. So that was one of the things that really helped us. So all the proctors had uniform settings to work with and it really helped. So, so that the experience was uniform across the board. So I just want right. to that in. Yeah. yeah, so you're talking about the Zoom settings, Zoom Esther? Settings. And yeah, okay, yeah. And so, yeah, we, we shared a bunch of Zoom settings um, so that we could have the same screen sharing settings, the same um, entrance settings. So whether we're having a wait, waiting room, um, and there was a whole thing at the beginning about Zoom bombing, so we followed ITS protocol and uh, turned off certain settings that would allow people to um, uh, enter the uh, uh, the, the uh, exam area. So, yep, uh, learning as we go along, and there was a lot of Zoom updates and changes and things, and some settings were actually locked down by ICT. Um, to make sure that that so things didn't happen. For example, having uh, only authorized Laurier uh, people um, enter. That meant that students had to have their own Laurier Zoom address. Um, so they, they needed to, Laurier Zoom account. So um, they had to have a uh, .wlu a, a Zoom account, um, which we helped them set up and ICT provided some great directions on that. Okay, so um, at this point, um, I think uh, we're pretty much done with the presentation. Yeah, there's a couple questions that have come in through the chat, and I'm sure as uh, as we're ending the um, and going through those, there will be some more that will be coming in uh, for us, Jane. So um, thank you, uh, Esther, Jane, and Jen, uh, for that uh, information. That's that's fantastic, and I'm sure that there's as with any system, it's. Uh, there's more information behind the scenes that, uh, that you po can't possibly uh, dream of going through in a session as short as today's. But uh, um, as I say, there's a couple of questions that have come in here. Uh, Cynthia is uh, is curious if these sessions are being recorded. Okay. Actually, I'll just get you to keep that uh, contact information screen up there, Jane, if you could. Are we still live? Sounds like we've lost connection here. Jane, Jen, or Esther, are you still there? I'm here. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm sorry. Some everything just went totally, totally uh, silent there for a moment and. And that so um, 
weird weird stuff in the world of Zoom. Uh, exactly why we're here talking about this. So, um, if I if I could just get you to put your contact information back up there while we're uh, going through this chain. Um, so I apologize for that uh, that interruption technical uh, uh, situation there. But Cynthia was just asking whether these proctoring sessions are recorded. Um, no, they're not recorded. Okay. Yeah, All right. And we make the student aware that they won't be recorded. Um, we have a number of students who have, uh, given the new environment, are very anxious. Um, some of them are very anxious about being recorded. Um, we don't do that, but we do make the students aware that any anomalies in We've lost, Jane, are you still there? Yep. Okay, things went silent again. Um, sorry, you, you were cut off just as you were, as you were finishing there. Oh, I'm sorry. So we do make students aware um, that we aren't recording, but that any anomaly will be uh, recorded by the proctor. So that's what we are recording things by hand. We're writing things down. Okay, okay perfect. So I guess I should be recording some of these anomalies that are happening with Zoom today. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, uh, and Cynthia on that um, just had added that uh, that she's finding this uh, this session very helpful as she has her first Zoom proctoring scheduled for this evening. So best wishes on that, Cynthia. Um, hopefully there's some helpful tips here that you can uh, can put to use tonight. And mm -hmm. we, Eduardo is uh, asking, is the proctoring one-on-one -on -one and how many exams do you usually proctor at the same time? I can uh, feel that, Jean. Um, so Eduardo, yeah, they're just one-to-one -one at this point. Um, we did look into potentially doing more at one time, but it just, yeah, it wasn't something that we were able to like easily do. So we just do a one-to-one -one, and there was one day during finals, I gotta be honest, I think there were like, Esther would clarify this too, like I think there was eight, like there, we had to use a lot of people and like an Esther or other invigilation assistant, Becca, I think did like several sessions that day. So yeah, we've had, uh, we've had some busy times for sure. I think just to add to that, what, what we were doing at the beginning was having an AT available, either myself or Tammy, um, for all the exams. And that was just, yeah, that, that was a nightmare because things overlapped. And, um, you know, we started, and it wasn't necessary to be there for the whole exam anyways. So we, our second round in the spring term, we decided that um, the proctors would send out email invites to us. Um, as ATs um, for backup and we would just let them know when we're going to be there. So if we're available for the first 20 minutes or, you know, until 4.30 or whenever. And, and then we have um, a, a means of uh, technical support where um, we have an exam email, I think it's called exam questions at WLU.ca, where uh, either the proctor or the student can um, email and get technical support immediately. So if they get disconnected or something like that, they can um, try and get some help to get back in or get some help with whatever's going on if, if we're not available. Okay. And uh, Caitlin is asking, um, how are you simultaneously monitoring the student, their environment and their screen and uh, detecting multiple monitors? Okay, so I think I'll jump in on that one. Um, the thing is, it is, so the way Zoom works, when the student shares their screen, you can monitor their screen. But the student, the video is also turned on throughout the exams. So you can monitor the screen at the same time, monitor the student. So both of the, you can see what the student is doing, all the movements they're making and everything um, throughout the exams. And also see that they are not opening things up because their screen is shared with you. So in that way, we are able to monitor both simultaneously. And then with the aspect of uh, detecting multiple monitors, we didn't have any of that come up, but we actually discussed about what um, some ways we could do that. Like um, if, it's, if you see a strange light coming from a particular direction, and you know, and all that, and to also ensure that students are focused on their screen. Uh, for I remember one of the exams I was uh, proctoring and the student was kind of, you know, 
looking into space kind of but you just have to call their attention that look i need to see your face at all at all times sometimes they're carried away and then they move out of the screen you need to let them know that you have to keep your face where i can see it at all times so those were some of the things we tried to do and uh, to ensure that we could monitor the student monitor the environment at all times as well but if there was a strange sound or they're looking in one direction for too long and all that then we ask the students to um, give an ind indication of what was happening. And it's all written down as well. Yeah. And to pick up on something you mentioned there, Esther, is uh, regarding the um, a student looking off into space during an exam. Um, I think that's uh, a comment that will stand on its own. The um, the. Other thing that I that uh, made me think is uh, possibly mouse clicks. I'm not sure if, uh, depending on the microphones and that, that the students are uh, using. Um, were, have you been able to uh, de to kind of detect the mouse clicking in the background sometimes and be able to use that for their nothing's happening on the screen, but yet they're clicking? Yes, um, we didn't have any incidents where that happened, where there were other things going on in the background. But usually, like I said, it just had to do with being completely focused on the student, like focusing for anything strange, anything that is out of the ordinary that is, seems to be going on at that time. And we try to ask the student, okay, what is that sound? And they sometimes say, oh, it's the wind or it's this or something like that. So we try to make sure that we're focused on the student and then pick anything that is just out of the ordinary and then um, query the student about it. And if it's something that has to be reported, we take note of it. Okay, perfect. Okay, and Lisa is uh, entered into the chat here. Do you feel that the majority of profs are willing to move away from the type of exam where you have to proctor with Zoom, such as uh, changing over to take home exams, projects, written assignments? I'm happy to jump in there. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we're definitely seeing some changes in spring term, and I think it's because faculty now have had some time to kind of digest all of this and kind of figure out how to approach things. Um, we did see a lot of finals go to um, take homes, which was fantastic, I think, for students, for everyone, right? Um, but I feel like there are now some faculty that are um, just recreating their tests and making them open book. And then there is no need for um, using lockdown browser. And so I think that that is something that we're starting to see and we may see this going into the fall. So we're kind of hopeful for in all respects, right? I think it's, it's uh, yeah, there's a lot of things that are real plus to that, right? So anyway, we'll see what happens, but that's what we're starting to see. Okay, great. And uh, just welcome anybody that has any questions that they'd like to answer um, uh, or any questions they'd like to ask and, and hopefully have answered um, if they'd like to unmute their microphone uh, uh, and take, uh, take the opportunity to speak versus use the chat, uh, please feel free to do so. Just wondering if anyone has uh, um, any questions out there specific to the assistive technology components and any complications or uh, any um, any helpful hints with uh, that technology working with Zoom. Okay. Sorry, did, uh, Jane, Esther, or Jennifer, did you have you guys um, found any? Any um, difficulties with the technology while you're while the students are using that within Zoom? Um, no, I don't think. I think Zoom's a pretty straightforward platform. I think the the difficulty, and I think for all of us, is the screen sharing bit. Um, one of the things is to make sure that the, the students shares their screen with sound so that we can hear what's going on. Um, so we need to. Um, that's part of the orientation. That, that you show the student how to just check the box and make sure that they share their sound. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, I think I'll just add a little bit to that. I think one of the things that has really helped was the orientation students have to do before the main exam. Because one of the issues we had, we had at the beginning was students had different types of headsets. So, um, and so with some, they have, before they can share the sound, they have to put in a password with others. It's a different modality and all that. 
So at the end of the day, we came up with, after encountering it a few times, we're able to decide that, okay, during the orientation time with Jane, with Jane, the students have to use the same laptop and the same headset for the orientation that they will be using for the exam so that we don't have. So during the orientation, the headset they're going to use for the finals is what they use. Um, Jen takes them through how to share their screen, how to share their sound, so that when it comes to the exam situation, then we don't have a lot of issues in that regard. Yeah, and that's, that's a really good point. May, may I ask a question? I'm Lyle Waves at Centennial College. Go ahead. How did you, and forgive me if you address this already, I had some connectivity issues. How did you address the aspect that regular students, maybe using lockdown browser or whatever, by themselves at home, whereas students with disabilities had a more rigorous, robust level of invigilation, potentially um, infantilizing these students in relation to how they're being tested. Was that ever raised by staff or by students? And how did you address it? Hi, yeah, I'm happy to jump in here. Um, yeah, nothing was raised to us of those kinds of uh, concerns. Um, you know, we, we just, uh, I guess, creating this process, I mean, we want students to have access to their AT, right? So my thought is, um, we had some faculty that said, you know what, I don't have a problem with uh, disabling lockdown browsers, student can write with Kurzweil at home on their, you know, and, and that was fine, right? That was some faculty were doing that, not a lot, but some. But this is a decision that came down from faculty, right? So in terms of they wanted some kind of monitoring. So not really something that was in, within our control. Um, but I don't recall hearing students, um, you know, kind of bringing those concerns forward. Um, Jane, did you hear anything about that? No, no. And I think we've tried to make the process as similar as possible, as close as possible to um, what is happening in lockdown browser in terms of, you know, sweeping the room with the, with the camera, um, that sort of thing. Um, I don't think that um, we've heard anything uh, about uh, students feeling that it's it's not fair that they have to, to use a, a private proctor. Um, a lot of students actually um, are happy to have a one-to-one -one proctor because there's actually somebody there to help them out um, if they get into trouble. So they're um, so far, it's been a positive experience. One of the things that we did was we used students. We, we actually had students come into the very first Zoom meetings with us and say, what do you think? Um, how's this going to work for you? So, and that was a very important part of, of making sure that students were comfortable with the process from the beginning. Um, so the proctors were there, we were there, um, exams was, were there. Um, and so we had the whole, the whole darn team there. <laughs> it was a huge Brady Bunch thing going on. Um, but we uh, wanted to make sure that students were comfortable with the environment. So we did a lot of testing. Okay, uh, that's great. Karen's got a question here um, about how did uh, you decide uh, between uh, Teams and Zoom? I can feel that. So basically, um, Teams was considered, um, but Zoom was a lot more user friendly. And um, in terms of being able to set up meetings, schedule things, and in terms of being the parallel teaching tool. So now in our second round, because Zooms is actually integrated into our uh, learning management system, there's actually a Zooms tab that the, student, that the profs go to schedule things. So all the students have Zoom accounts now. Um, so there should be no students out there where we're saying, hey, this is a new tool, Zoom, you have to learn it. Um, this is what you have to do. Everybody's using it for all their classes. So um, it really is it really is a seamless process now. Um, at the beginning, it wasn't, um, but really we had a lot of difficulty with students logging into Teams, um, things dropping out. Um, so Zoom was just a much smoother process. Um, so we tested both Zoom, Zoom and Teams with students and proctors at the beginning. Okay, great. 
Great, and uh, Lisa is uh, asking, do you know the cost of the Zoom? Actually, there's three questions here from Lisa. Um, is uh, first, do you know the cost of a Zoom license? Gosh, I don't know. I would have to ask AVIT um, what the Zoom license is. Uh, I don't know if I could get that information, but I can certainly I can certainly uh, pass along if I I can find it out. Okay, and that would be I am expecting you guys have a, a institutional license versus uh, um, any individual licenses. That's so. correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then second question from Lisa is, how do you administer the orientation? Well, I'm glad you asked Lisa. I have actually a document here. Um, so maybe what I'll do is I'll stop the screen share and I'll share that document. Yeah, great. So this document here is um, called the Virtual Proctoring Orientation and um, Doug will post this up. Uh, I've taken out all the email addresses and things like that in there. So it's sort of a more generic document, um, but basically gives you steps for training people to do virtual proctoring. So they're gonna check the, the training schedule to see how students appear in the list. So that, that document that I shared before with all the students' names, their times, their uh, exam dates, they're gonna check that. And under this column called orientation status, um, they're going to um, email the student and ask them uh, what when a good time would be to meet and they're going to update this orientation status um, column. Um, if they're new to virtual proctoring, we've got some uh, email templates. Um, if, they're, if they've already had a, a proctoring session, we just want to know if, they, if there's anything that we need to update. So if they have new equipment, if they have new headphones, um, especially those Apple earbuds, whoa, those are <laughs> problematic. Um, then we want to test those things out. So um, we send them an email and say, you know, if you have any questions, anything's not working, if you have any new equipment, any updates at all, if you're using different software, let's get together and just try that out and make sure it's working. So once uh, meeting time is agreed upon, we send an email link to the student. Um, if they have a new Zoom account, it, it will be included if they're new to the university or Zoom. Most students now have a Zoom account, so it's not so much of an issue. So then there's a, a, a track checklist here um, that um, Doug can post. And um, we also have an offer to students to um, go in and, and test their assistive technology with actual questions in this course called the ALC Sandbox. Um, so they can go in with under self-registration into our learning management system and actually register for this course and then go in there on their own um, and mess around, just try out the, the questions with their assistive technology and make sure everything's working for them. So um, even we can do that with the student or if they prefer, they can do that on their own um, later on. And we can get, we do multiple sessions too. So sometimes students go, uh, well, you know, I, I did the orientation, but I'm not really sure about this. Can you just, can we just meet quickly to go over this one thing? And yeah, sure. So if we can make that happen before their exam, we make it happen. Um, I do want to emphasize that the, you are required to attend an orientation session um, the first time you use the system because there's just too much bad things that can happen. <laughs> so you need to attend it. Um, if you don't attend it, then, um, and Jen, you can maybe speak to this a little bit, then you, we, we um, will not allow, not set up the exam that you'll need to write it with your class and we'll make these students very aware of that. Yeah, that's correct, Jade. So the student would not go into our schedule and they would have to write at home without their accommodation for, they'd have their extra time, but not the AT. Um, so yeah, so this document will be posted. Um, I'm not going to go through like the whole thing here, but yeah, it's, it's there for you and you can use it as you see fit. Great. I appreciate you sharing that as well, Jane. Uh, there's one other question here. You kind of touched on it as you were going through that document. Uh, Lisa is also, the, her third question is um, asking about whether students need to buy their own headset. No. Um, they can use pretty much anything that works. We've typically found that the um, in the microphone in the computer works sometimes, and but it's not as good, obviously, as a you know a wired-in mic. Um, so my preference would be a wired-in mic than 
um, Bluetooth than using the the condenser mic or the mic that's in the in the laptop itself, um, because it's just it's just not as good as picking up sound. The MacBook Pros they're they're good. Um, they seem to be have quite good microphones, but some of the other computers, and we test this out with the students. So we'll work out some sort of solution with them. We haven't had a student yet where we've had to give them a mic, but we're working now on the protocols for um, sending students equipment. Um, students always have uh, earbuds or something that they can use with a microphone in it. So as long as the microphone's close to their mouth, it works out pretty, pretty, you know, pretty well. Um, we do have some troubleshooting steps for them. Um, that we can we make available. Um, so part of the orientation is, you know, that little up arrow beside the mic, that's how you, you go in and you change your, your audio input. Um, same with the video, we try and go over some of those things with them quickly um, so they know that um, that's available to them and the proctor can help them out as well, um, troubleshoot their sound. And I know Esther's done, <laughs> done quite a bit of that as well. Okay, great. Um... That was all the questions that were in the chat, and I just uh, invite anyone uh, last few moments here to uh, add their question in if they still uh, have one they'd like us to answer, as well as if anybody would like to unmute their microphone and join in by voice, uh, please uh, feel free to do so. So um, we'll just give a moment here for that to happen if anybody wants to unmute themselves. The Zoom silence, the dreaded Zoom silence, um, as we as we wait for people to to be able to uh, to react. So, okay, I'm not seeing any uh, any microphones becoming unmuted or any other comments in the uh, in the chat. So, oh, Ann, I you, oh. you need to wait. I'm late. Sorry. That's uh, okay. Is this Anne? Anne, uh, you Sorry. know that knows me well enough to know that I can't let something go by. I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for today. I think you guys have set a gold standard by which every university should be doing this. And I, I sincerely hope this, this recording of this video gets widely shared and that your philosophies and the, the support that you offer and that the steps that you've put in place to benefit students is widely adopted. Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. All right. And thank you, Anne. Um, so um, as, we, as uh, we just finish off here, if anybody else wants to unmute their microphone for questions or comments, by all means, uh, feel free. I'm seeing lots of thank yous coming in through the, uh, the chat here and appreciation as Anne shared there as well. So. Um, just as we near the end of the session, I, I want to take the time, uh, take a moment here to thank, uh, thank you, uh, Jane, Jen, and Esther for sharing with us today. Um, Anne said it perfectly, so uh, I can't say it any better. Um, but uh, as assistive technology professionals, um, and in our audience today, we have a lot of people who are related professionals who are, um, we work alongside uh, with accommodated exams and exam services. Um, all of us, we're always adding to our toolboxes because they're never full, nor can we ever have uh, too many options. So this information, no doubt, is going to just uh, do, do nothing but further assist each of us in better serving those that we support, the students and that. So um, I've uh, just resumed the screen sharing here a few moments ago, and um, I, I want to thank you, thank everybody for their support of the assistive technology profession and the network of assistive technologists. Um, your support and, and uh, participation today is greatly appreciated. So please uh, do keep in touch. And uh, um, for the team at Laurier, thank you again so very much. Um, the documents will be posted along with replay over the next few days. And that information will also be sent out to the uh, registered participants. And uh, uh, Jane, Jen, and Esther, if you have anything else that you'd like to add or update the, uh, the, the participants on, uh, by all means, feel free to share it and I can get that out to those who have registered as well as to update it as, you're, as uh, things progress. I'm, I'm sure um, you're going you're gonna to find even better ways to do something that you've, you've found amazing ways to do already. So. Well, it's always a work in progress. It. <laughs> we were a little nervous about today because it was, it's, it's, uh, uh, we still are changing things day by day by day. 
Um, so we have documents on the go that we're, we're editing, the, the orientation, the, you know, how we're communicating with students, how Jen and her team, how they're communicating with instructors and that sort of thing. So it's, it's very much a work in progress and you just got to keep, you know, hammering away at it, little, the little things to make it better and better. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, again, um, thank you. And, and lastly, for everyone here today, thank you for joining us. Just remember, you can't spell education without AT.